Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning from Melbourne and hello to our international guests uh, who have stayed up quite late today. I'm coming to you from Bunurong and Woiwurrung country uh, in Nam. I pay my respects to First Nations people from across the country who come from a very long line of storytellers, truth tellers, our nation's first storytellers. My name is Karen Percy. I'm the media section president of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance, which represents more than 5,000 journalists and media workers. And our whole union represents more than 15,000 members across the creative sector. So uh, of Australia. Now, some we may have some colleagues from the National Union of jo Journalists joining us. So I'm not quite sure who they might be, but um, we welcome you as well. And this is a briefing for uh, Australian journalists and our union members in particular. And it has been uh, arranged at the request of Julian Assange's legal team. And it really is to reinforce the high stakes of next week's high court hearing for Julian and the implications of a successful extradition outcome and what that would have for all journalists worldwide. So it's been great this week to see Australian politicians uh, send a very clear message about his case, but we really cannot take anything for granted. Julian Assange has been a member of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance since 2007. And in 2011, WikiLeaks received the Walkley Award for Outstanding Contribution to Journalism for the work he and others did in revealing civilian deaths and possible war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it is important to understand that uh, Julian is being prosecuted for basic public interest journalism, cultivating sources, receiving information and publishing it to the world, exposing wrongdoing and criminality. It's also important that all journalists have accurate and factual information about this case, which is why happy, uh, Mia is happy to facilitate this meeting today. So uh, firstly, the panellists, with just a bit of housekeeping here, um, please put yourselves on mute, um, folks, if you, unless you're speaking, and that will be most of you. Great, Stella's arrived. Um, so the panellists understand that this is a room full of journalists and that anything they say is on the record. Uh, each panellist has been allocated around 10 minutes to speak and there will be time, we hope, um, and if they're happy to take questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A uh, box down the bottom, at the bottom of the screen, making sure you identify yourself, please. And to facilitate as many questions as possible, I will actually be asking those questions on your behalf. So make sure you say who the question, if it's somebody particular you want answering it, what your question is and who you are, that would be really helpful. And if you wish to live tweet, um, unless any of your panelists uh, object to that, the hashtag is hashtag free Assange. Use please the at with Mia handle. So we're going to be hearing from four people today who have deep knowledge and understanding of this case and, of course, the broader issues that this case throws up. Uh, Jennifer Robinson, Australian human rights lawyer and barrister based in London, who's been part of le uh, uh, Julian's legal team for the past decade. She's uh, calling in from London, uh, 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 where it's late there. Stella Assange, the London-based human rights lawyer and Julia Assange's wife since 2022. Uh, together, they have two young sons. Kristen Frafenson, Icelandic investigative journalist who first worked with Julian in 2010 and has been editor in chief, in chief of WikiLeaks since 2018. Welcome, Kristen. And Rebecca Vincent, head of campaigns at Reporters Without Borders and the only NGO representative to attend every day of Julian's legal hearings in person. RSF was founded in France in 1985 and is one of the world's leading advocates for the defence and promotion of press freedom. So there we have it. Um, I'm going to call on Jen Robinson to kick us off. And just a reminder, folks, to put your questions in the Q&A. We will get them towards the end. So, Jen, you have 10-ish minutes. Thank you, Karen, and thanks to the MEAA. Uh, we have been so grateful for your support for Julian and for recognising him as a member and the journalist that he is. So it's great to be with you all this evening. I wish we were speaking about um, happier subjects, um, but I'm going to give you a little rundown of the appeal that we're facing next week, uh, which is potentially Julian's final appeal in the British courts. So, um, as you'll remember, we won the, the extradition case. We've been challenging uh, the indictment and extradition request for Julian since 2019. In early 2021, we won the case on the narrow grounds that his extradition would be oppressive under Section 91 of the Extradition Act because of the particular mental health 
uh, difficulties he faces, his autistic diagnosis or being on the spectrum, and the oppressive prison conditions he'd face if extradited to the United States. So on that basis, the district, the magistrate uh, refused extradition. So we won. The US appealed, offered a conditional assurance, which as Amnesty said, is not worth the paper it's written on. Um, we weren't able to test that assurance in the evidential hearing because it came after the evidential hearing. And nevertheless, the British courts and the Home Secretary, uh, the British courts upheld the US's appeal and the Home Secretary ordered Julian's extradition, despite the medical evidence that the prison conditions would cause him to commit suicide. Um, we are now, uh, we, we renewed our permission to appeal against that decision and against the Home Secretary's decision to extradite. That was rejected on all grounds at the end of last year. So this is actually a renewal hearing. You don't have uh, permission to appeal as a right in this, in this country. So we're seeking permission to appeal. We're renewing our application, which was rejected on all grounds at the end of last year. Um, and if it is again rejected by the High Court in this hearing, there is no further appeal for Julian in the UK. So just to make clear, if we do not get permission this week, Julian can be extradited to the United States uh, and he could be on a plane. That's how imminent and urgent his situation is. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the grounds of appeal, just so you understand the shape of what it's going to look like and then what will a few possibilities of what what the next couple of months could look like, or the next weeks even. Um, there's a number of grounds of appeal, and I'm going to run through them quite quickly. I'm happy to answer more questions, and we can share a media briefing for you that provides a little bit more detail. Um, but our first ground of appeal is that Julian should not be extradited to face prosecution and punishment for his political opinions, exposing state criminality. So it is a bar to extradition um, to be prosecuted for um political opinions and in, including for exposing state criminality. We say that Julian has revealed widespread evidence of criminality on behalf of the United States government, including war crimes and torture. Um, we put extensive evidence of this before the district judge, including also Julian's political opinions about the importance of transparency and holding governments to account, which is the entire ethos behind WikiLeaks and indeed um, public interest journalism. Uh, so that is the first ground. We, um, we're we also including as part of this ground of appeal the new evidence that emerged since the evidential hearing back in 2020, which is the fact that now that we know that the CIA had planned to kidnap and kill Julian um, and that, that this evidence plays into um, the persecution that we say he's facing because of his political opinions. Uh, the second ground relates to the, to the uncertainty of the law so we're saying that Julian should not be extradited because he shouldn't face be, shouldn't be extradited to face prosecution where the criminal law is being extended in unprecedented and unforeseeable ways, which violates Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and what we're arguing here is that the US is crossing a new legal threshold. This is the first time in US history that the Espionage Act is being used against to criminally prosecute a publisher. Um, and that breaks a long-held tradition and unbroken practice of non-prosecution of publishers in the United States. Um, and for all these reasons, we had expert evidence in the, in, the, in the case here about how this would cross a new legal frontier and that it breaks all legal precedents. Um, the third ground of appeal is what you all expect and, and our, one of our key public advocacy points, which is it shouldn't be extradited, excuse me, because his prosecution amounts to a grave violation of his right to free speech and article excuse me, <clears throat> under Article 10 of the European Convention. Um, again, this relates to uh, the unprecedented nature of the prosecution, the disproportionate punishment and interference with, with free speech protections, engaging in journalistic activity as he was. Um, the fourth ground relates to the fact that, as, as you may have all heard and you ought to understand, that one of the positions that the prosecution has made clear in their evidence um, in a sworn affidavit that was put before the courts in the UK is that Julian may not, well, they're saying that they're going to argue that he doesn't benefit from First Amendment and free speech protections at all because he's an Australian citizen. Now, that's a dangerous argument. We've been arguing for many years that the nature of this prosecution is dangerous because it means any journalist anywhere in the world uh, could face prosecution and extradition to the United States for publishing truthful information about the United States. What the US is doing is extending their criminal jurisdiction to touch anyone who publishes US information and potentially, quote unquote, damages the United States, harms their reputation, national security, et cetera. 
But what they're saying is they'll extend that jurisdiction over you as journalists outside of the jurisdiction. But once you're in their jurisdiction, they're not going to give you constitutional protections because you're a foreigner. So it should concern all of you on the call. It could, should concern every single journalist um, anywhere in the world. Um, but that, that is what the US is arguing. And we say he shouldn't be extradited to face prosecution where that is the position the government is taking. Our fifth ground relates to a fair trial. We're saying he's not going to get a fair trial in the United States. Uh, related to the location of the trial, the jurors are going to be pulled from um, government contractors in the Eastern District of Virginia, government contractors, intelligence agents, et cetera. Um, and of course, the very political nature that, that a jury will be sensitive to the public comments that have been made by, for example, the President of the United States, the CIA director and other high ranking US officials that which all together taint the presumption of innocence. Relevant to that ground too is the evidence obtained through inhuman and degrading treatment of Chelsea Manning and the seizure of legally privileged material and the spying on us as his lawyers. We say in those circumstances he can't get a fair trial. Um, I don't know how I'm going for time, but I'll quickly run through the last couple of grounds. Um, the sixth ground relates to the UK-US extradition treaty. Um, the treaty itself, which forms the very basis for any extradition request between the US and the UK, prohibits the extradition of anyone um, on the ground for political offences. And espionage is the most typical recognised political offence under international law. So in fact, we say the entire request is unlawful under international law, under the terms of the treaty, and it's an abusive process for the US to have even attempted to seek his extradition in these circumstances. Um, the final couple of grounds relate to the admission of uh, new evidence about the CIA plot to kidnap and kill him. And finally, that the extra extradition treaty um, allows the US to add additional charges once he's in the United States, which could expose him to the death penalty, which is not permitted um, and should bar his extradition. I'm happy to answer any further questions, but just to say quickly, if we're unsuccessful, again, we there is no further appeal. Our Julian will have no recourse to the British courts. We're done in the UK. Um, the only ground, the only potential legal avenue we have left to us if we're unsuccessful in this appeal is the applying to the European Court of Human Rights. We would have to make a provisional measures application, which would um, be an order from the European Court that he should not be extradited pending a determination of the European Court of our application to prevent his extradition. And we have we think we have a strong application, but this is an exceptional measure. There were 63 uh, similar types of applications made last year to the European Court in deportation or extradition cases, and in only one case was it granted. Um, so this is not a given. And there are really concerning noises coming out of the, the British government um, in the context of of the last time the UK got the, the European Court granted provisional measures about the fact that they should pull out of the European Court, that we shouldn't respect European Court decisions. And so there's a real question about whether the European Court will provide us with a real remedy. So if we're unsuccessful, he could very well be on a plane to the United States to prison conditions where the medical evidence shows that he will be caused to commit his suicide. So when Stella says that his life is at risk, she's not exaggerating, that is the medical evidence. And that's how urgent this situation is. So I'm happy to circulate the media briefing and take any other questions, but that's what the appeal looks like. And unfortunately, that is the very sharp end of the case that we're facing. Thanks, Jennifer. And we will hold off on questions to the end. And just uh, remember, folks, please put your questions in the Q&A box um, and I will read them out on your behalf. So um, we are going to hear from um, Stella Assange. Uh, Stella and Julian were married in 2022. They have uh, two young sons, and of course, she's a human rights lawyer in her own right. So, uh, Stella, please uh, give us an indication uh, that you can hear us, and um, if you're ready to to start speaking. Hi. Um, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I found a quiet spot somewhere in Knightsbridge, so hopefully there won't be any traffic. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we're, we're now a few days away from what I believe and um, statistically is most likely to be Julian's last public hearing hearing uh, in the UK. Um, it's a two-day hearing. It will be on Tuesday and Wednesday, and everything... Um, basically turns on what what happens in the next um, week to be clear Julian the only prospect for Julian to be freed 
in the um, short term is a political solution. If Julian loses this round, um, he will apply, as Jen said, to the European Court of Human Rights. If we are successful and the European Court of Human Rights issues an interim uh, provisional measure, which is not a given, um, they only do it in the rarest of circumstances when there's irreparable harm. And of course, we say that there's irreparable harm here and that his life is at risk if he's extradited. Um, even if that is successful, it would mean um, potentially years of Julian remaining incarcerated. So the only realistic solution to Julian being freed from indefinite uh, detention is a political solution, either the US dropping the case or some other solution. And of course, the Australian government is instrumental in contributing to delivering a political solution. Um, we are dangerously near uh, new elections, both in the US and Australia. Julian is running out of time. And um, this is the moment to achieve um, a solution. Things could get very com complicated very quickly. And um, of course, the political situation is out of our hands, but the political situation is also what determines this case. It's a political case, depending on who's in the White House, Julian is prosecuted or he's not. We know from the Obama administration, which um, said in during the uh, at the end of the um, administration that um, they would commute uh, Chelsea Manning's sentence. Um, she was freed and that they were not prepared to bring a case against Julian because to do so, uh, they would have to set a precedent that could then be used against the rest of the press, the New York Times problem, as they called it. And there is no uh, change in the um, in the implications. There is still a New York Times problem. The only difference is that there was a different administration that brought the indictment, and that was the Trump administration. And um, that was because the Trump administration had a very um, antagonistic uh, relationship with the press. They wanted to set a precedent. Uh, there were many leaks, there were many whistleblowers, and there were many publications of things that the Trump administration didn't want to have aired. And so they took this case, um, the attorney general took this case and also in the context of CIA director Mike Pompeo um, with his own motivations and his own sinister plans at the CIA to kidnap and murder Julian, um, who was instigating this prosecution. And he says so in his book, who which um, no one has read except for um, his initial um, political hack. Um, or whatever it was, uh, which bought up many copies of his book. But if you read it, he takes credit for influencing the decision to prosecute Julian. And of course, this is the true concept, context of his prosecution. It is politically motivated. It is not motivated by pursuing any um, uh, legal ends. It's, it's motivated by pursuing political ends. And that is why this is the first time in the more than 100-year um, existence of the Espionage Act, this unprecedented decision to take a case to apply this uh, law to a publisher for publishing true information um, and for publishing it for the purpose of informing the public um, is politically motivated. Uh, Julian is um, in Belmarsh prison, as you know, the last time I saw him was on the 3rd of February. Uh, I went with the kids. It was a Saturday and um, uh, I haven't, I wasn't able to visit over this weekend because I was ill um, and I didn't want Julian to get ill. Uh, but we, we've spoken today and uh, it's obviously a very stressful time for him. Um, when you come near a hearing, it's uh, 
a period of sleepless nights and uh, a lot of stress, obviously. And of course, we know uh, from other cases that the UK has extradited um, within a matter of 24 hours after the final decision. And we are now facing um, potentially, but I think uh, most likely a final decision in the UK courts. And there is precedent for the UK moving extremely fast um, within 24 hours, sending an extraditee to the United States, uh, the Abu Hamza case, along with two others. Uh, so it's been done bef before. And the only thing I think protecting Julian right now, apart from a potential order for the from the European Court of Human Rights, an injunction, uh, if he loses, is public opinion, is the world's eyes on this case. And that is why you guys are all um, essential uh, to um, delivering uh, the message that, that uh, the world is watching. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Stella. Uh, Kristen Frothenson is uh, the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks and has been since 2018 an Icelandic investigative journalist who worked with Julian first back in 2010. So, Kristen, please, your perspective. Uh, thank you, and thank you for hosting this uh, meeting. Um, it cannot be understated how important this case is for the, uh, the future of uh, press freedom uh, globally. Uh, it is uh, a line in the sand. If we cross uh, this line, uh, we have stated that it's obvious that no journalist anywhere in the world is safe. Uh, and putting it simply, if an Australian journalist, uh, an Australian citizen who publishes in Europe can be put in, uh, in the United States publishing truthful information, uh, not a single journalist anywhere in the world is safe. And that, of course, applies to other Australian journalists. So the interest is huge. It's the first time the Espionage Act is being used, this uh, blunt instrument, this hammer, uh, which does not allow public interest uh, defense, is used against a journalist. But it certainly will not be the last uh, in the time that it's being used. It is obvious that... Uh, the uh, persecution of Julian Assange says, is, has an, an aim to have a chilling effect on uh, uh, other journalists uh, to shy away from exposing embarrassing or, or harmful secrets of governments, uh, although they are truthful. And that especially applies to uh, national security reporting, which is, is more and more important in our days. And uh, I can argue that that, that uh, chilling effect has already been visible and uh, the precedent has already been set. We've seen actions around the world where obviously uh, uh, copycat measures in the crackdown on journalists have been taken. Uh, you, have, uh, you have witnessed that and, and seen that in your country. Uh, uh, the, uh, I recall the, the raiding of uh, the... Um, uh, the offices of the national broadcasters, to just name one example, uh, we can see that this is sending a signal to others in countries where, where we uh, claim uh, are uh, less democratic than uh, we claim to be. Uh, the imprisonment of uh, Evan Gersovich in, in Russia, for example, uh, uh, who is being charged as Julian with espionage. So the, the chilling effect is already out there. And uh, uh, the danger that uh, journalists are facing if they, they cross this line is, is already already here. So we need all to uh, put our efforts together to push back against uh, uh, this measure and stop the extradition of Julian Assange. Um, but of course, we need to fight. Uh, it is at the root and uh, fight for the, the US government to drop the, the charges entirely. They are baseless. They are absurd. They have no legal merit. Jen did run through the points that are going to be presented to, to the, the courts in London next week. Uh, there are dozens of those. Each and every one of them should suffice to stop the extradition. And it's absurd this is still continuing. Just a simple fact that the country asking for the extradition has plotted on the highest level of 
government, in the halls of power, in the White House, draw plans to kidnap uh, and assassinate Julian Assange should be enough. If it, any other country would be a player in this uh, uh, absurdity, there would be no question that the extradition would never take place. Just this single fact, and there are so many other arguments against it. Now, Stella mentioned the political dimension. Of course, that's what we've been claiming all along. And it's seeping in little by little when we see this uh, uh, proceedings in the UK courts here, which have uh, been uh, um, surreal at times to watch. Uh, the, uh, the surreal uh, elements, for example, that an appeal court would, uh, uh, on a single piece of paper that they call uh, diplomatic assurances or assurances, uh, overturn the decision of a lower court. Uh, in the first round in this case, uh, as Jens says, is not uh, where the paper is written on. It has no bearing even in the U.S. system. The Bureau of Prisons is independent. It can decide to put Julian Assange into total isolation. It uh, will not abide by any, any, any uh, messaging, even from the Justice Department or the State Department, who is issuing a diplomatic assurance, uh, so-called. Uh, the only agency that actually can uh, influence the situation uh, under which Julian Assange will be imprisoned uh, after he had is the CIA, who can demand that he's put in total isolation. That's the very agency that plotted to kidnap and assassinate him. So this is uh, the reality we are facing. And uh, the only thing that the proceedings, in my opinion, in London and through political is a political prisoner and as Sela says it could be uh, remedied through political means so that's where uh, Australian journalists come in uh, and their work is, is so important uh, we of course are very heartened by the fact that there was a, a total change of tune in Canberra and the Albanese government has been uh, coming on board and pushing for Julian's release but bear in mind that it did not escape us that uh, months ago, months ago, uh, Albert was in his uh, uh, disappointment that he, the solution was not already, already in after he had said that enough is enough, that Julian should have suffered enough. Uh, and uh, uh, during his visit, uh, I believe it was the week, weekend of the king's coronation, he unprecedentedly went on an interview with the Australian media and said that he was disappointed by the fact that this had not already been uh, solved. And that was more than half a year ago. We're still here in the same position. And we're talking about, of course, uh, a request, obvious request to find a solution to this matter from a, a, a very important strategic partner in the United States, which Australia, both in terms of trade and defense. So uh, I could put it the other way. Uh, uh, the Albanese government needs uh, the, um, um, the push and the assistance. Uh, he needs to be able to, Washington, this is that concerns my nation very gravely. It is obvious all the says so, and uh, that he on and uh, push the system to come to a solution. So there the journalists come in, and that's not activism. It's basically reporting on the facts of the matter, which are there, which I am uh, fully aware of through my contact in Australia. The nation wants Julian out, wants him to be able to return to his home. Uh, they uh, agree with Albanese that enough is enough, and that was something that was a reality a long time ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, Australian journalists stay on the story, report on all the facts, uh, and uh, the facts are uh, stories of horror, of, of uh, abuse, and a suffering of an individual for all of these uh, almost 14 years that he has been deprived of uh, liberty in one form or the other. So I'll leave it here for now, but uh, happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much, Kristen. We're now going to hear from Rebecca Vincent from Reporters Without Borders. Um, there you go. Uh, Rebecca, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Karen. Um, I think a lot of the key points have already been made, uh, just to reinforce that from Reporters Without Borders. The reason that we defend Julian Assange is because of his contributions to journalism. So we do believe this case is absolutely about journalism. It's about press freedom. Um, we've been trying to find a way to cut through the noise uh, around this case. In, and what I mean by that is the unhelpful noise. Um, just yesterday, we published addressing some of the most common misconceptions. And I think that's worth mentioning here too. Um, I think a lot of your attendees, hopefully, are those who know the case very well, have been reporting on this for years. Um, but we still find so many help unhelpful things around the world, either um, that undermine the case or sort of make it about things that it's that it is not. And in particular, in the United States, I think they're still uh, reporting in a way that um, puts Julian in a light that makes it less popular to defend him. So we've we've tried to cut through some of that and remind the world that free expression organizations, press freedom organizations, human rights organizations, a growing number of journalists and media, um, and in fact now policymakers around the world are rallying in support of uh, Julian Assange at this crucial time. Our organization has followed proceedings throughout. Um, we hope to be there next week. Um, the MEAA has let me know that some of the attendees and other members are having some issues with access. So I'll take a moment on that issue. Um, <laughs> we are an NGO, so we have a different role to journalists, um, but we have also faced extensive difficulties at each stage. Um, that's why we're the only NGO to have actually made it in is because it really took a fight. And by that, I meant, I mean that very often how we could get in involved up to five hours of queuing, very early in the morning to then follow a full day of court proceedings and uh, you know write about it and do media in the evening. So these were very long days. At some points this went on, um, the evidentiary portion went on for more than four weeks. That's unsustainable. Um, at some points it was in freezing temperatures. Um, at one point in the pandemic, I was threatened with arrest simply for queuing outside court to try to get in. So this is a situation for NGOs. Uh, it seems to have been a bit more straightforward for journalists, but I know at this moment many are Asking around, I've heard I've heard from many people who are planning travel, et cetera, that still don't have confirmation from the court about their access. Um, so I I imagine that's affecting your members too. All I can say is that this court, um, this is not new. The entire extra extradition proceedings, which have now been uh, at, at a number of courts now with several different judges involved, these access problems have remained. So at this stage, I would say it it cannot just be a matter of incompetence. There has to be a degree of this that is intentional in some way. They have known about this for a long time. There is no excuse uh, for access to not be handled in a way uh, that allows uh, for journalists and NGOs and other parties who are there to do their jobs to actually do so. This case is overwhelmingly in the public interest. It is so important to bear witness. Um, as an NGO, we look for different things than journalists. And uh, if we can't get into court, then there's no way we can follow. So at the moment, um, we have been told we will have places in court but it's difficult to fully trust that given the history. And so I always have to try several different things to get in. Um, I also wanted to mention, because I, I discussed it earlier today at a briefing we did in London for the first time, and I'd like to share it with this group too, that um, along the same lines of these access issues, we had difficulties attempting to visit Julian Assange in prison. Uh, some of you may have seen last April, we were barred access when we had been vetted and had a confirmed visit with Julian. The, at the time, prison officials told us that they had, quote unquote, received intelligence that we were journalists and therefore we would not be allowed in. Our arguments that we were there as an NGO, that our work is as an NGO, which has a different role. I mean, we are engaged in advocacy and campaigning. We're not, we weren't there to uh, try to interview him for media reporting. Uh, it didn't matter on the spot, but we fought that for four months and finally were then able to gain that access. So today, for the first time, we've started to talk publicly about the fact that we were able to visit Julian four times between August and January. Um, the last time I was in was was just a few weeks ago. Um, and I think Stella has mentioned he, at sometimes he's not been well, especially after Christmas. So the last time I saw him was quite concerning. He was in a lot of pain from a broken rib um, that had been caused by excessive coughing. So his situation remains quite grim, but I wanted to highlight it too because of the access issues. Um, not many have had access to Julian in prison. He's at this point probably the best known political prisoner in the world. Um, many people don't know what has happened to him, where he is. Um, I find that especially in America, people still seem to think he's in the embassy or just have no clue. He is in a high security prison in the UK where he has been for nearly five years. Uh, I think as a person, 
uh, that that has sort of been lost in in all of this other noise around the case too, and it's worth bearing in mind. Um, I think as well, I'll just touch on the political nature of the case. Uh, of course, we're still hoping that somehow at this late stage that the British judicial system will deliver some form of justice and put a stop uh, to this before extradition proceedings um, go any further. However, it is a political case. It may require a political solution. Uh, we've been encouraged by the stronger representations being made by the Australian government. So I would say to Australian journalists present, please keep it up in terms of reporting and putting pressure on your government there. I think it is making a difference in the case. Um, the US government needs to feel that pressure uh, from other governments and from its own citizens. So, you know, public opinion and all of the reporting going on around the world remains hugely important too. But it, it's worth remembering that Julian Assange has a different role than others who have been pursued under the Espionage Act. Chelsea Manning, the leaker in this case, only served seven years in prison. I say only, she shouldn't have been in prison either, for especially for seven years. But I, I bring that uh, to this discussion too, just to say that there is a way out of this. If the US government will not back down on a point of principle, will not just simply let him go uh, and close the case as we have been so often calling for, there is also another way to say, hey, enough is enough, time has been served. He's been in a, a high security prison for five years. When the leaker has served seven, the, the, the fact that the publisher faces up to 175 years in prison is absolutely absurd. Um, there are ways out of this if the political will is there. And I think the media still plays a very, very important role in ensuring that there is pressure there that could allow for political will to emerge where so far it is lacking. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm actually going to pick up, there are a number of questions, but I just want to pick up on that uh, political solutions. I'd like to hear from Jen, I'd like to hear from Kristen, and I'd like from here to hear from Stella, other options on that political solution, if you've each got some ideas, because Rebecca's obviously given us one there, which is just uh, that it's time served. What else might work? Perhaps we'll hear from Jen first. Uh, thanks for asking about the political solution. Um, we are obviously really pleased with the um, resolution in Australian Parliament over the past day, supported by the government and by crossbenchers, which is an unprecedented showing of political support to ensure that Julian can come home. The Australian government can and should be negotiating with the United States government and could be asking for this case to be dropped. That's our number one ask and that's the ask that we've, what we've been saying for many, many years. Uh, we are grateful to the Prime Minister, both for his support for the resolution um, in this week in Parliament, but also for being true to his word. He said enough is enough and he has been raising it with the um, President of the United States and we are working with the Australian government to seek a resolution. Um, what that resolution could look like is many things. Obviously, our number one priority would be to have the case dropped. But as Rebecca said, Julian's already spent so much time in prison. Um, there were representations made by the prosecutor in the extradition proceedings here saying that, you know, oh, don't worry about it, judge. It's a, it's not going to be 175 years. He's likely to only get something like five and a half years. Now, we have evidence before the court in terms of the sentencing guidelines in the US that that is, um, that is far more likely that he'll get a much longer sentence uh, under the basic sentencing guidelines. But when you've got the prosecutor themselves making that represent representation to the court and Julian's already spent more time than that in prison, then why are we even having this fight anymore? Um, enough is enough. So I think time served would be another sensible solution. But the question is whether the United States is is going to come to the table and and look to a more sensible solution. Remembering, so it's remembering it's that the big, the big political argy-bargy that's going on right there and how that might play out. Stella, I'm keen to hear whether you've got anything, uh, any other suggestions as well. Thank you, Jen. Well, of course, a political pardon um, from the US president is also a possibility. Of course, if, if it's a pardon, then it implies that um, he did something wrong in the first place. And in terms of the interest of the journalistic community, the only I say positive, but uh, remotely positive outcome would have would be if the case were dropped, an acknowledgement that it would have never, it should never have been brought. Um, Julian is accused of receiving information from Chelsea Manning, 
uh, possessing it and communicating it to the public. And that is the precedent that now stands that the U.S. administration has established that publishers and journalists can can um, be indicted under the Espionage Act for doing journalism. That is right there, right now. It's not about a potential a conviction down the line. Um, it's the very fact of bringing an, a case against a publisher, a journalist who has uh, published information in, in the public interest um, under this uh, draconian piece of legislation that has been applied extraterritorially, uh, which carries um, 175 years and um, under some provisions, uh, the death sentence. So uh, the only way to uh, really address this case in a way that preserves press freedom really is to drop the charges and to acknowledge that it should never have been brought. And that was actually the Obama administration's position. It's not, you know, pie in the sky. It is a position that has already been taken by a previous administration, which uh, stated that it was not going to bring charges against Julian um, and that commuted Ch Chelsea Manning's sentence. And when this was uh, communicated, um, the Department of Justice spokesperson, Matthew Miller, who um, uh, many of you might know because he's now a spokesperson for the Biden administration, um, he stated that uh, the Obama administration was not going to bring a prosecution in relation to Chelsea Manning because Julian is a publisher, he's not a hacker. That was his words. Um, and that he that uh, the Obama administration was not willing to bring a case that would establish a precedent that could be used against the rest of the press in this case or any other future case. Uh, the Obama administration was simply not going to do that. What happened? Well, the Trump administration was prepared to do that. Uh, so we're not talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, um, something that that is untenable. It is uh, something that's uh, that should have been done under the Biden administration and uh, where the Biden administration has failed, of course. Um, and uh, that's what the the journalistic community's interest is in the case being dropped because anything other than that, even a even a solution where Julian is free tomorrow, where he's not, where the charges are not dropped, is um, extremely uh, dangerous and difficult, and a precedent that's going to be used against the rest of the press, and it's just a matter of time. Thank you, Stella. If you could just weigh in quickly, Kristen, because we've got a few more questions. Thank you. Yeah, just just quickly. I mean, uh, it's um, uh, it's a big ask, ask actually to 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 ask us to come up with a solution to a problem that uh, that was created in the in the United States. Uh, they should find the solution to this mess because it certainly will be a mess and an ever increasing mess if this is continued. I mean, one one scenario could be that they simply withdraw the extradition request and uh, allow Julian to return to Australia uh, and or, to, or another country of his choosing. That doesn't take away the underlying problem. It will still remain there. They could to put that under review, uh, the, the indictment, and to take some time, but he needs to be freed. Um, uh, I think that uh, it is probably slowly dawning on the, on the, the uh, powers in Washington D.C. that, uh, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, this this Julian's case has uh, not uh, uh, been drawing so much attention in the United States. It has quieted down. Uh, it's been dragging on, and it, it's out of the news circle. Uh, there are other issues, and the the process has been so long. It's it's unimaginable that, that Julian is still in prison after almost five years, five years in April, uh, while we're still in the process of fighting extradition. Uh, I, I've been mentioning today that uh, the, I believe the request, to you correct me, Jan, if I'm wrong, that the request for an appeal originally went in in September uh, 2022. 
in, and uh, the first answer by the single judge came 10 months later, last summer. Uh, his name is Justice Swift, by the way. Uh, and now eight months later, we are in this second round in February 2024 to ask two judges to, um, to uh, uh, opine on the decision taken by Justice Swift in June last year, in a, where he answered to the, all the hundreds of pages of documents where all the arguments presented with a, a slip of paper, I think two and a half pages long, with no argument. And I'm paraphrasing here, but when I read through it, it sounded like, nah, I don't think there's a case here. There were no arguments here. He just, he didn't like the case. It's, it's uh, the absurdity of this process. The process which we call punishment, it's punishment through process. They've been keeping Kristen, him yeah. lingering in this dungeon thank you, in Belgrade. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, this is a question from Laurie Patton to Jennifer. Does Julian deny aiding and abetting the theft of the US military files? It's important to understand that he is not just charged with journalism. Julian, Julian engaged in the same kinds of activities that all journalists engage in all day, every day. He received and published government information, which is the same as what journalism do, journalists do all day, every day. Um, and so that's the best answer that I can give you. Thank you. Kathy Vogan has a question. The proposed changes in the safety of Rwanda bill, this is the UK legislation looking at moving uh, migrants that concern application to the European Commission for Human Rights, Community for Human Rights, I should say, disallow application by a group of refugees, but continue to allow individual application. And that would be under the condition that it would be gravely dangerous to extradite uh, that individual to that particular country. Wouldn't the plot to extrajudicially kidnap or kill Jack Julian justify a stay in Julian's case? I'm guessing that's probably best served uh, by Jen as well. Well, yes, of course we have a we have a very we have a very strong European Court of Applica European Court of Human Rights application prepared, and we say that Julian's case absolutely meets that threshold and the threshold for the exercise of the jurisdiction for the European Court. Um, it's not just the plot to extrajudicially kidnap and kill him. It's it's the established medical evidence of of the impact of the prison conditions on him and the risk that it is to his life. Um, so we have very strong grounds, um, but we are concerned about the political dialogue here in the UK and the sounds coming out of the British government about whether or not to remain in in the Euro European Court jurisdiction and and whether to in fact to comply with with orders from the court. So. Again, and even leaving aside that debate, it is an exceptional measure. So, um, no matter how serious the case is, we say this is an this is an exceptional case, and it justifies the exercise of the jurisdiction of the court. But we have to acknowledge that that these cases it's very rare for these provisional measures to be granted, and so we say Julian's case is one such rare exceptional case. But uh, only one of sixty three applications was approved last year, so we have to be realistic that. This is there's no guarantee in Julian's case. Uh, we have a question from Flick. Jen, is it the case that the Espionage Act doesn't mention the words journalism or journalist, or does the Act deal with publishing and journalism per se? While the chill over journalists and journalism is hard to measure, surely lawyers and news organisations are already more wary in advising editorial decisions based on this case. I get uh, Rebecca may well be able to weigh in on that as well, but I'll let you have a uh, first shot, Jen. Sure. Uh, well, the Espionage Act, as you rightly point out, doesn't refer to journalists uh, or journalism because it was never intended to apply to journalists or journalism. This is an Espionage Act. What does espionage mean? It is about <laughs> espionage, not publishers. And so this is a real overreach by the US, US government in extending uh, this statute towards, not just towards um, spies, but to, to journalists. So, and it, th this is an act from 1980. It's an antiquated piece of legislation that shouldn't be on the books, should be rewritten, and certainly shouldn't be applying to, to journalists and publishers. I mean, this is why the, the DOJ now has new guidelines under the Biden administration saying that they will not pursue journalists um, for criminal prosecution. Julian's case is a, is a complete aberration and a violation of their own media policy, new media policy. 
So the case is outrageous and it is having a chilling effect on national security journalism. We have been hearing this from journalists and lawyers in newsrooms since the Chelsea Manning proceedings back in 2011. I remember standing at in Fort Worth with national security journalists who were there reporting on Chelsea Manning's prosecution. That was at then the pretrial phase. And they were pulling me aside saying, Jen, this is terrifying. If, if, if our sources and an organisation like WikiLeaks is going to be, our source is going to be prosecuted for aiding the enemy and, um, and criminal acts of that nature for providing information to the media and, and that Ju Julian risk prosecution under the Espionage Act, then national security journalism is over. And, and we have to look at it those terms. This is criminalising, as the New York Times and Washington Post have said, this is criminalising public interest journalistic practices. And there's no, there's no other way around it. It is the death knell of national security and public interest journalism in the United States and around the world. Uh, Rebecca. Yes, I fully agree with what Jen has said um, about the Espionage Act. In fact, there are growing calls for Espionage Act reform. Um, in fact, that's from a broader community than those that even support uh, Julian Assange. And so that's a that's an advocacy challenge for all of us, too, is to get those folks on side on this case, too. Um, from a press freedom perspective, our main concern is that it lacks a public interest defense. So if it is used in this way, and as Jen has pointed out, it was never intended to be used in this way, but this is where we are now. If it is used in this way, nobody accused uh, in this manner can adequately defend themselves. We've seen it used against uh, whistleblowers who can also be considered journalistic sources, but Julian is in, in fact the first publisher being pursued in this way. And so it's the precedent that will be set. Um, through this law, which shouldn't be applied. Maybe if I could tie it back earlier to just about the, the question on the hacking allegation. Look, there are, out of the 175 years, there uh, there's only five years tied to that allegation of solicitation of hacking. And that is, I think, very aptly uh, represented by, the, the, by Julian's legal defense here, why that is also observed. We haven't seen any real evidence, of, um, at least in the extradition proceedings in London courts on that point either. But... I don't think it's a mistake that since the issuing of the superseding indictment, the U.S. rhetoric has been more about that charge, the one charge under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, than the 17 counts under the Espionage Act. This is absolutely an Espionage Act case. And so I, I think those attempts to reframe it are probably to divert um, the support that has been forthcoming, especially rebuilt over the recent years by the free expression and uh, journalistic community. So in any case, 175 years you know, 170 of those under the Espionage Act cannot be overlooked. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. We've got a few um, last minute questions that have come in thick and fast and we may not have um, time for them. And I'm going to suggest that please come at some of the journalists, uh, if there are access issues that you want to raise, that could be something that as a group we can talk about after the main panellists, we can let them go because I think there is an issue that we can um, be uh, raising. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, quickly, uh, Martin Newman, question, do you think the parliamentary motion here in Australia this week calling for Julian's release is likely to have any impact on either the US or UK government's position? I mean, I think we do need to be realistic here. Um, Stella, perhaps you might like to weigh in on that. How important was that shift in, in uh, position by the Australian government? I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, Two thirds of the Australian parliament is impossible to uh, ignore. And in fact, we've seen very positive coverage of this uh, motion of this resolution in both the US press and uh, the UK, specifically the Washington Post and the BBC. I was positively surprised that they covered it. Um, but I think it is a sign and acknowledgement that uh, this show of um, incredible um, uh, support in the unprecedented support by the Australian government for, for its citizen um, is, well, impossible to ignore. And uh, I must say, actually, um, this morning we had a briefing with the foreign, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> with the foreign press here in London and uh, the room was absolutely bursting. I think there's finally um, uh, an understanding of recognition about um, what is really happening here, um, the implications it has for everyone who is committed to um, 
reporting freely and without uh, intimidation. And uh, I think it's a positive development. And of course, uh, the Australian government's support for the motion sends a very strong signal. Albanese has um, made further comments, which are extremely important. And as I said, the only prospect for Julian actually being released in the short term is a political solution. Even if he were to win the next round, which I think is unlikely, um, that would just mean that it would go to a full appeal at the High Court in I don't know how many months. And that would mean Julian remaining imprisoned for probably another year um, and continuing to face 175 years. So uh, that's the reality that the political support is essential. Um, it needs to be sustained by press attention. Um, and uh, this, of course, has a very significant influence both in the US and the UK uh, about um, concern and, and uh, the world's uh, eyes watching what is going on. Thank you so much. There are a couple of other questions there, one about advocacy by the health sector regarding um, Julian's um, health situation and another about, I'm guessing it's kind of the hypocrisy of uh, the US government um, trying to complain about when its citizens are pulled into other countries. Uh, judicial and criminal systems. But um, we are out of time. And I don't want, I'm just mindful that particularly here in Australia, the working day is getting um, going. So uh, I do want to thank our fabulous panellists today for giving us a really good insight into uh, Julian Assange's case at this crucial time. Um, uh, thank you for your advocacy for Julian, who has been a member for a very long time. Um, for MIA members who would like to stay on the line regarding this media access issue, Rebecca has uh, said in our chat here that, in fact, uh, pretty much nobody anecdotally has been confirmed to be able to attend or tune into the live stream. So uh, there's no doubt that the court has been uh, overwhelmed, I imagine, by uh, people wanting to get in, but that's not to say that there aren't some issues that she raised earlier. So uh, anybody who wants to stay on the line to discuss this access issue, please do, um, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but I want uh, you all to thank, uh, by acclamation, uh, the, um, the panellists today and wish them very good luck over the number of um, days and weeks to come, which will no doubt be a very difficult um, situation. So thank you for the work and the efforts that you make and um, uh, we, we send you all the support that we can. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.